Good day, this is Brakela PhD, and my PhD stands for Post Hole Digger. Yes folks, you hear it right. Brakela earned his PhD in the Desert University, the School of Hard Knocks. I might also say it has taken me a lifetime. I started, I was born in 1950, in June, and right now we're talking 2020, late in the year, so we're talking just about before the elections in the United States, October 2020. That makes me 70 years of age, and I like to introduce myself, just so you know, and you have a feel. Who are you dealing with, and why am I sharing what I'm sharing today? The peace that passes all understanding. I am promoting restorative justice. Restorative justice to the source of all life. We have heard so many years, for so long, peace, peace, peace. And in the process of creating peace as mankind, as humanity, we killed, maimed, destroyed many, many, many millions of people. First, we did it because we believed in politics. We believed in our money, or we believed in our spirituality or religion. And in the name of religion, we chop someone's head off. In the name of our money, we put someone in prison. In the name of our politics, P-M-S. Doesn't that sound familiar? There were three lying spirits released on this world. 
we are talking about the basic instructions before leaving Earth. What in the world is that? Some people like to think about it as something that is still very short called the Bible. Yes, folks, I am one of those people that will check everything before I make a comment. So restorative justice was created because it has been originating with the Native Americans in Canada and North America. The people that populated before any Americans were there were the Native Americans, First Nations, and many other names in between. But they were happy. They were dealing their life and doing what they were aiming for. Aztecs were also a group of people that were conquered by others, people that had a different color face, different color eyes, blue or like mine, gray, and for some scary reason, when you have blue or gray eyes, that makes you more important than the other person, whatever that person is. And so we are looking at restorative justice because it does not matter where you come from. You want peace. And in order to get peace, there are some basic principles. And we are going to apply that during restorative justice. Soothing music. Like I said, I will introduce myself and give you an idea of what and who I am. I was born in a family. My dad was Dutch in the Navy and my mom was from half Chinese, half Venezuelan or somewhere from the islands. I've never really been able to figure it out because my mother passed away in Holland when I was barely six years of age. So my remembrance and my staying in a normal home was only six years. So less than 10% of my life I've spent in a family. So you can imagine that it has been a little bit confusing for me to when I grew up as a kid to figure out what I needed to do. So I started reading books. I love books. Books at that time, that was in 1956, was an escape for me. And I went all over the world and saw one day I would be moving out of the Netherlands and would be going to all over the world. And I did. But before I got to that point, my father, who had worked very hard, had five kids. And when he was barely 31 years of age, his uh, wife passed away, my mom, and we went through an orphanage. And for seven years, it took almost seven years before my father remarried and found somebody willing to raise us. By then, I was outgrown a family. I didn't fit in anymore. And so very shortly after their marriage, I was basically going to school, high school, and then seminary, because now I was out of the home again. And from there on, I went on and on and on. And basically from seminary, I went to Bible school, electrical schooling, uh, learning to work and prepare blueprints and electrical engineering. But somewhere, somehow, I fell into the pattern of curiosity. I was always wondering why, how come? And when the youth were standing up and the nosums and the provosts and whatever was moving in, in Amsterdam, and then we had the Beatles and so on, we came up with an idea of having a march for God. We wanted to show that there were young people still around that believed in ideals. And so we organized a march for Jesus. Yes, folks, I, at that time, was not more aware than you about Jesus. I was an evangelist preaching in the prison. Did that for over 12 years. But in the process, I saw so many things that didn't make sense. I also got excommunicated three times from different religions because I asked the wrong questions. I asked why, how come, I don't understand. Can you explain to me why this is? And as I kept on seeking and searching and looking, I didn't understand. I moved out and I had a chance to travel around the world. A merchant marine is a nice award for it. 
But the bottom line is I traveled all over and saw and noticed that people are not different. People in Hong Kong are the same as in Rotterdam. The people in Rotterdam are the same as in Canada and Toronto. And in Toronto, the people are still the same as in the United States. And people in the United States are still the same as in South America or in Japan or Korea or where I lived for a while in Thailand, Indonesia, all over the place, wherever I came and wherever I visited, I saw people were the same. Whether you had white skin, black skin, yellow skin, or no skin. Inside was something that most people forgot because we always look at the outside. We want to see, we want to feel, we want to take, feel something. But you know, life is more than just feeling and restorative justice will be dealing with that aspect because we want balance in our life. And in order to have balance, we have to have peace. And in order to get peace, we need to understand some basic rules because without it, we've got a hard time, folks, figuring out what in the world do we need to do. And so that is what we are going to debate or not debate, explain and go over. How I found myself, not only as an evangelist, advising people in maximum security in Scheveningen where Milosevic uh, passed away, but how in Canada as we were rebuilding and why was were we rebuilding in Canada? I had so-called everything at an early age and we had a nice big home right beside the Minister of Finance in the Netherlands. We lived in a big house with 12 rooms. We had different businesses, a publishing company and a record. We had a music. We just got a record. We had a music group. We traveled. I spoke. I was a public speaker. We had a magazine. I loved photography. Traveling was part of my life. And all of a sudden, when our son was born, something new, beautiful. But what was the problem? The problem was somewhere, somehow, there was a mistake during the delivery in the hospital. And during the time that we had to come back and check and so on, seven and a half months later, he passed away in my arms. And that is where I learned a lesson that is very hard to understand. With all the monies that we generated and we did them blah, 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 and whatever goods we wanted to do and good wanted to do, influence people and so on, there was something that you can only learn when you go through it. See, my son passed away in my own arms. 10 o'clock, January the 30th, 1978. I never forget it. My wife called me and said, Bob, there's something going on. And so I, I went, picked him up, and he was lifeless. I called the doctor. The doctor said, okay, 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 come over here. And we had to wait for five or seven minutes because somebody had to get dressed. Now, if there is anything I couldn't care less, was a naked woman or a naked man, my son was there and he was lifeless. Can you help us? And all the doctor could say is, sorry, sir, he just passed away. The pain, the sorrow, the agony, this is what you can only understand when you go through it. And during that time, I realized one thing. With all the zig zigglers, all the motivation, with everything I had learned, it didn't matter. When you don't have life, you've got nothing. It doesn't matter if your bed is from gold and your car is in platinum and you have diamond rings all over your fingers. If there is no life in you, you are kaput, gone, over, out, zero. To get back on track as a family and my wife and I, we were devastated. The pain, the sorrow, it changed me. I had to speak in prison and the next day or the next weekend, I forgot. It was shortly thereafter. And I shared this with the inmates about my son. A lot of them were crying because they had children. They understood. And some of them said, when did this happen? Is it last week? And they couldn't understand how I could share this shortly thereafter because we were driven by motivation. 
we were driven to help, to reach out, to warn people, don't get caught up. Guess what happened? I got caught up. When we had a chance to move to Canada, we had to sell everything. And in the process, I made mistakes. I am well aware of it. I filled a container, a 20 foot container and a 15 footer, forgot 10, 15 or 20 footer. It was a big container. Filled it with all the stuff that we had, the, my books. I love books as I mentioned and I had quite a lot. A lot of my study books as well. Anyway, from there, when we arrived, the business I had purchased that we were going to move into and work together with another Dutchman went bankrupt. There went my income. Oops. The country we moved in was just on strike. There was a postal strike. Interest rates soared to 21% and the money that we had on us, which was substantial, was only worth 50 cents on the dollar. Weird experience when you count on a whole bunch more. And in a very short little while, chop, chop, chop. And we had to start all over, building up our lives. Now it was without the help of my dad's business because my dad's business helped me to establish myself rather quickly. I never realized that my dad had such an impact on my life. He had been working for many, many, many years in the insurance field, the mortgage field and uh, mortgages. So I was in that same field doing extremely well because of his portfolios. But when I had to start all over again and went to work with an insurance company, Monarch, in Toronto, downtown, on Bay and Young, that was awesome. First of all, I noticed, although I spoke English, Business English is completely different. I had to really work on getting that typical landed immigrant way of talking out of my system. Then I had to learn so many other things. See, restorative justice is not about what you know. It's what you're willing to learn. And as we went through it, eventually I got to know the lawyers, the people that I was working with to get myself working on Wall Street. And on a private bank, I thought this was it, till I had to make another decision. It was a simple thing, a large, big, $100 million plus transaction. I'd been working on it for six months. Everything was hunky-dory. But there's always a but. Behold the underlying truth, but B-U-T. Behold the underlying truth. There was a little snake, a little other, a little poisonous issue. Somebody gave me just before the close of the transaction a report, a laboratory report. That laboratory report would dictate or implicate, depending how you looked at it, dictate the truth or implicate you in a lie. I discovered that weekend, just before we were to sign the deal and commissions would start flowing and not a few dollars, but millions of dollars, that there was a little problem. The report had been fuzzled with. Somebody had been fudging the numbers by 10%. Now on a transaction of a hundred million dollar plus, I'd learned one thing. $100 million plus times 10% is a lot of money. 100% over a dollar is a lot of money. But I tell you, again, there is restorative justice from what? From being greedy. And as I was talking with the lawyer who happens to be also a preacher, he was my partner. He told me, Bob, just a white little lie. Just shut up. Close the deal, and we both make a lot of money. This is a man of God, a man that really knew his business. He was also a lawyer. Wow, I had a major, major decision to make, and he decided to tell the truth. My banker friend, who was Jewish, 
and really found this peculiar because he said, I've never seen a person like you torpedo his own deal. The lawyer and the congregation we visited kicked us out. How was I so stupid? How could I be so stupid? Why in the world could I not keep my white lie going? Excuse me? Why couldn't I keep my mouth shut for one moment instead of telling the truth? And based on that story, based on that experience, because it was not a story, it was real, we got outcasted by a group of people that were praying and preaching and doing all kinds of wonderful things. But they told me, Bob, do you know what you could have done with all those millions of dollars that would have come to us? Because part was going to go to them in the church. And that is where I start to wonder. Does God need me? Does God need my money? Whose money is it anyway? And how come that in politics, in money management, and in spirituality or religion, there is such a weird belief? And that is how restorative justice started getting an anchor in my life. Because we got challenged. As I went through this ordeal, we ended up with our own business. I ended up with my own office and 5,000 square foot, 10,000 square foot building. It was 10,000, first started off half, and then we took the whole building. Millions of, bis millions of dollars of business that we were doing, and all of a sudden, we are worth on paper billions of dollars. And that is where the problem started. Amazing grace. I'm now married for 20 years. We have two wonderful kids, Canadians. But I got more problems than I want to because most of my friends are only lawyers defending me. And after spending millions of dollars, I found out that the only person that got paid in a lawsuit is either the lawyers, the judge, or the opposition. Anyway, I just wanted you to be aware that I do know what I'm talking about. The major challenge was not so much that I do know what I'm talking about. I didn't know what I was talking about because as I was discovering, I noticed that I seemed to be doing things that most people say, don't, don't tell the truth, keep your mouth shut. Why can you not just be quiet for a moment so we can share the money? Why are we in a society that only cares for money? And as we continue with restorative justice, I will share with you what happened after that, because that is what my book, Deception Protocol for the Prodigal Son. It is published, it's on Amazon and it's available. But I tell you, that is how the book came in existence. You know a little bit now about me and what drives me. I want to share with you how you can go and get restorative justice, how you can get peace and not just be driven by money. Yes, it's a lot of money, five billion to lose, eventually after 18 years in court and being totally sucked dry by anything that's called a lawyer. But the reality is I got set free from a belief system that only turns around money. Because I don't need money. I am free. And of course we use money in this world, but all my needs are met according His riches in glory. I want to share with you what that is.